Welcome to the Invite Health Podcast, where our degreed healthcare professionals are excited to offer you the most important health and wellness information you need to make informed choices about your health. You can learn more about the products discussed in each of these episodes and all that Invite Health has to offer at www.invitehealth.com slash podcast. First time customers can use promo code podcast at checkout for an additional 15% off your first purchase. Let's get started. Did you know back in the day when artificial sweeteners really hit the market, people were really intrigued by them because they were this really unique alternative to sugar because they were basically adding no calories to your diet. So this was very attractive to many people. They thought, wow, I can have something that's very, very sweet, but yet it doesn't have any calories to it. So this must be a good thing. But there is a really big catch that we have to know about. And that is that artificial sweeteners, as the name implies, is artificial. And we know that these sweeteners are widely used in a whole variety of different foods, in particular foods that are contained in the standard American diet. So a lot of the processed foods, for example, a lot of the powdered drink mixes, soft drinks obviously are very, very commonly, you, any of the diet sodas, for example, is going to have the, the artificial sweeteners in it. Looking at you know, different dairy products, canned foods, you know, jellies. There's so many different places where they sneak in these artificial sweeteners, but yet they market it as, well, this is a safer, healthier alternative because it's less calories. Well, there's a lot of science that we need to go through so we can debunk this really kind of profound misinformation on artificial sweeteners. And they really are quite dangerous for our health. Now, we have to be able to decipher plant-based natural sweeteners, things such as stevia, for example, um, or xylitol, which is very common from natural fruits. So looking at those versus looking at, you know, the high fructose corn syrup, looking at saccharin, all of these other artificial sweeteners that we know can be incredibly damaging to the human body. And I want to talk in some detail about the different scientific studies that have come out that continue to prove that these artificial sweeteners are dangerous. So I am Amanda Williams, MD, MPH. And many years ago, when the U.S. Food and Drug Administration deemed certain artificial sweeteners as being what they call GRAS, generally recognized as safe, we started to to see this trend where it's like, okay, you're categorizing as safe, but yet there's so much science that is really supporting the fact that these sweeteners can actually cause cancer, can create metabolic syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And we know this and study after study continues to back this. And we need to be aware of the fact that the sugar lobby um, companies are are very very powerful, and the the fact that they've been able to push these sweeteners into our everyday common foods is a very very alarming thing. And I want to talk a little bit about let's just look at high fructose corn syrup just as a starting point. We know that high fructose corn syrup was really embraced by this country in the mid-1970s. And this is when they started to just pump high fructose corn syrup as an alternative sweetener into so many of the different food products, including soft drinks. And so this is, to this day, um, we are still dealing with the ramifications of high fructose corn syrup, which is a liquid sweetener. It's an alternative to table sugar. So that's sucrose is your table sugar. Now, what we recognize is the reason why they were using the high fructose corn syrup as opposed to table sugar was really an, an economic reason. And they could make and mass produce this high fructose corn syrup that had this really, really sweet um, taste to it and put it into foods 
but yet it was much, much cheaper for companies to be able to do this. Now, one of the points that I like to make about this when we look at the history of high fructose corn syrup here in the United States is the direct correlation between when high fructose corn syrup was first introduced into our food supply back in the mid 70s. And then in the early 1980s, there was this really rapid rise in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in a pediatric population. And that is something that should be alarming to anyone to hear that. And recognizing that the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the pediatric population is estimated to be upwards of 10%, which is absolutely astronomical. Now, what they also don't tell you about that astronomical amount of 10% of children can have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, meaning they're damaging their livers before they even, you know, become teenagers, is that this rate technically can be even higher than that because we're seeing the rate of pediatric obesity go up. And they estimate that as high as 70 to 80 percent of those children who are categorized as being obese will also have the comorbid issue of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And in the, the Journal of Children, they published this correlation of pediatric non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and why it is so incredibly linked to the foods. And one of the areas that we cannot overlook, and the Journal of Hepatology looked at this, was fructose and high fructose corn syrup as being this major mediator of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And we know that this is a, a big issue here in this country. And we can correlate that with metabolic syndrome, with diabetes, and understanding that we are doing this to ourselves. And we now have to re-educate and understand that we need to go back to the natural sugars that are coming naturally from your fruits, that are coming from plants, as opposed to these artificial sweeteners that are incredibly damning to the human body. Because you have to think about this. You have to think about like when saccharin, for example, first came out and saccharin is like sweet and low. And they, they originally put a label on it saying, you know, we believe here at the FDA and the National Cancer Institute that, you know, there is this potential that the saccharin could lead to cancer. So they were listing it as a carcinogen. But that's now all changed. And even in spite of the fact that there is this mounting clinical and laboratory evidence that point to the dangerous health consequences of these artificial sweeteners, the government has now decided that they are generally recognized as safe. And that should scare the living daylights out of anyone. So we have to know what to do. And you have to be aware that the sweet foods that you are taking in should be coming from a natural sweetener. So if you want something sweet, it should be coming from, I don't know, eating an apple, for example, or you know, having a bowl of blueberries. This is a much better option than the aspartame and the high fructose corn syrup and the saccharin and the sucralose. All of these things that we know can create so many different long-term, long-lasting, and incredibly detrimental health effects. So when we break down just some of the basic um, artificial sweeteners, for example, we have aspartame, and that's going to be like equal or NutraSweet. You have your high fructose corn syrup, which we know has been peppered through everything. That's why now when you go into a grocery store, you see even on ketchup bottles, you know, now contains no high fructose corn syrup, or you'll grab a box of cereal and it says, now with no high fructose corn syrup, because they understand the consumers are becoming wiser to this. But you have to also recognize that high fructose corn syrup has been directly linked to insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, high triglycerides. We understand that aspartame, that equal 
you know, goes by the brand name Equal, that that has been linked to migraines, ringing in the ears, hyperactivity, saccharin, which is sweet and low, certainly has been shown to have nervous system implications and is a known carcinogen. Splenda, which is sucralose, we know can create some significant GI issues, nausea, diarrhea, bloating, all of these things that we know, but yet they're still out there in the market. And you have to be wise to what you consume. Understanding that there has been so much clinical research out there and looking at the health outcomes of non-nutritive sweeteners, the Nutrition Journal did a study back in 2017 and really assessed a whole meta-analysis. They went through over 300 different clinical studies looking at the long-term implications in terms of cardiovascular effects, chronic kidney disease, the links with diabetes, high blood pressure, just from using artificial sweeteners. And it is absolutely a very, very strong link to this. But yet, we have seen this year after year, where it's marketed towards diabetics, for example. And these artificial sweeteners is a better option as opposed to table sugar for the regulation of their blood sugar. Now, let's just be clear as to what those artificial sweeteners are actually doing. They're not raising their blood glucose. No, it doesn't raise the blood glucose. But what it does do is it impacts the insulin. So now we are creating a situation where we are worsening insulin resistance in people who already have insulin resistance. And this is why these things should not even be in our foods. They shouldn't even be allowed, knowing what we now know. In the Journal of Nutrients, they looked at the artificial sweeteners and their implications to the development of metabolic syndrome. And looking at that direct correlation and how it manipulates the gut microbiome. So that means that those artificial sweeteners are actually changing the way that the intestines are regulating food and nutrient absorption. At the same time, it's creating insulin resistance. We know this. We understand that artificial sweeteners have been promoted as a means to help combat obesity and be the best choice for people who struggle with high glucose levels. But now we realize that that is all for none because we can see through study after study how much of an implication these different artificial sweeteners are having on driving up obesity, on creating the worsening of insulin resistance. They published a study back in 2020 looking at the effect of artificial sweeteners on insulin resistance among type 2 diabetics. So we already know type 2 diabetic is already going to be prone to having insulin resistance. And in this study that they did, they showed that the use of artificial sweeteners had a direct impact, a direct impact, not an indirect, but a direct impact on insulin resistance. So it's just mind boggling. When I used to work with diabetics in diabetes self-management courses, this was one area that we would focus a lot on was, is sugar free, these artificial sweeteners? Is this a better alternative for you? And absolutely it is not. We see that it is actually making things worse. We have seen in pediatric studies the overall metabolic effects that these artificial sweeteners are having in young kids. As I mentioned, beyond that of just the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that we know is created. So why is it that we are still dealing with these? Well, part of it comes down to consumers not doing enough of their own research, you know, basically kind of believing what 
they think, you know, the government is saying that this is generally recognized as safe. So if it's in the foods, it must be okay. No, this is not the case. And the, the one study that really caught my eye many years ago was when they looked at diet sodas. And they did a really full scope study assessing diet soda consumption. So what does that mean? That means we're using artificial sweeteners. So, you know, we can look at Diet Coke, Diet Pepsi, doesn't matter. And looking at the relationship to the development of diabetes, the development of diabetes. So in the current development nutrition journal, they did a study where they followed a group of participants over a 10 year time frame. And these are people who on a daily basis were consuming diet soda. And what they were able to find was that not only was it that these diet sodas increased the risk, but they found it to be a direct independent risk factor. So it wasn't like, well, maybe they were having the diet soda, but still the other portions of their diet wasn't good. And that's what led to the diabetes. No, they said it was the diet soda directly that was creating the development of diabetes. So you have all these people running around drinking their diet sodas, thinking that they're doing the right thing. Oh, this is low calorie or zero calorie, and it doesn't have real sugar, so it's going to help so I don't gain weight. But now we know that that's not true. We know that when we have insulin resistance, we are going to gain weight. We know that we're going to get a cortisol imbalance. We know all of these things now. And looking at the, the role that diet sodas have in the development, not only of type 2 diabetes, but also metabolic syndrome. But yet people are still consuming these things on a regular basis. And for me, in the, the world of nutrition and the world of medicine, the two should be an easy, easy fix. We should not be using artificial sweeteners. If we are using an artificial sweetener, then that is a major health risk. When we use a true sugar alternative, it should be coming from nature. So such as stevia or xylitol, which is directly derived from fruit. Those are the only things that we should be choosing if we're not using direct sugar. And just the scary effects that we know that these sweeteners can do to our overall health, changing the gut microbiome, increasing our risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We see it clearly when they introduced high fructose corn syrup in the 70s and not even a decade later, you get this astronomical spike in fatty liver disease in children. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to connect those dots. And I think the more we know about the foods that we consume, the more that we should be gearing towards let's eat foods that resemble foods because they are real foods. So having fruits and vegetables as opposed to processed foods is one little step towards avoiding our exposure to these very harmful artificial sweeteners. Now I could do you know, a podcast just on each individual artificial sweetener and go into the science and the links between all of these harmful long lasting health effects. But I just wanted to give a brief overview that artificial, the name in and of itself implies it's artificial, we shouldn't be putting it into our body. But the science behind it and understanding the long lasting effects of these artificial sweeteners. Why would you drink a diet soda if within five to 10 years that could maybe create a situation where you now are a diabetic? It doesn't make sense. Why would you give a child food that contains high fructose corn syrup knowing now that within five to 10 years that child could have a major liver issue? These are the things that we have to be cognizant of and we have to choose our foods wisely. And the things that we drink as well. So the next time you go into a store and it says zero calorie, you better look at that very closely and see 
what are they pumping into this? What is the artificial sweetener? And am I willing to take that risk with my health in order to feel in my mind I am shaving off a few calories from my day? So that is all that I have for you for today. I want to thank you so much for tuning in to the Invite Health Podcast. Remember, you can find all of our episodes for free wherever you listen to podcasts or by visiting invitehealth.com slash podcast. Now, do make sure that you subscribe and you leave us a review. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Invite Health. And we will see you next time for another episode of the Invite Health Podcast. Welcome to the Invite Health Podcast, where our degreed healthcare professionals are excited to offer you the most important health and wellness information you need to make informed choices about your health. You can learn more about the products discussed in each of these episodes and all that Invite Health has to offer at www.invitehealth.com slash podcast. First time customers can use promo code podcast at checkout for an additional 15% off your first purchase. Let's get started.